by the 1960s, right, there had been over 100 years of argumentation in economics and in politics, and the socialists could sense that they were losing. And by the 1960s, it was clear that the great socialist experiments were failing nastily. Okay. So put yourself in the shoes of a smart, more or less open to the evidence socialist, and you're confronted with all this data. How do you react? Yeah. You've got a deep commitment to socialism. You feel that it's true. You want it to be true. You've pinned all of your dreams of a peaceful and a prosperous society on socialism and all of your hopes for curing any ills that you see in current society. Now this is a moment of truth for anyone who has experienced the agony of a deeply cherished hypothesis run aground on the rocks of reality. What do you do? Do you abandon your theory and go with the facts? Or do you find or try to find a way to maintain your theory and your belief in it? Now, there's a historically parallel example that I alluded to earlier, or last yesterday, and I want to draw a parallel here. I think in the 1960s, the academic left was facing the same dilemma that religious thinkers were thinking or facing in the 1700s, the late 1700s. In both cases, the evidence was overwhelmingly against them. During the Enlightenment, religion's natural theology arguments were widely seen as being full of holes and science was rapidly filling the gap. It was giving naturalistic and opposite explanations for the kinds of things that religion had traditionally explained. Religion was, again, in danger of being laughed out of intellectual debate. By the 1960s, the left's arguments for the fruitfulness and decency of socialism were failing in theory and practice, and capitalism was rapidly increasing everyone's standard of living and showing itself respectful of human freedoms. By the late 1700s, religious thinkers had a choice. Accept the evidence and logic as the ultimate court of appeals and thereby reject their deeply cherished religious ideals. Or, and here's the strategy, you can reject the idea that logic and evidence are the ultimate court of appeal. I had to deny knowledge, wrote Kant in the critique, in order to make room for faith. Faith writes Kierkegaard in Fear and Trembling, requires the crucifixion of reason. And so he proceeded to do that and glorify the irrational. The left thinkers of the 1960s faced the same choice. Confronted by the continuing flourishing of capitalism and the continued poverty and brutality, they decided, like Kant, to limit reason to try to crucify it. And so Heidegger, coming along and exalting feeling over reason, is a godsend. Kuhn's theory-laden paradigms, Quine's pragmatic and internalist account of language and logic do the same thing. So the idea here is that the dominance in the academy of skeptical and irrationalist epistemologies provides the academic left with a new strategy. Confronted by ruthless logic, harsh evidence, they have a solution. That's only logic and evidence. Logic and evidence are subjective. You can't really prove anything. Feelings are deeper than logic. And my feelings say socialism. So that's my second hypothesis about the origins of postmodernism. And I call it the Kierkegaardian hypothesis. That socialism is the crisis of, or sorry, postmodernism is the crisis of faith of the academic left. Okay. Its epistemology justifies taking a personal leap of faith and continuing to believe your socialist ideals. Okay. All right, so, so far what I've done is two things. I'm, I've tried to account for socialism's subjectivism and relativism on the one hand and its monolithic left-wing politics on the other and saying that there's a deep connection between the two. Now if this is Correct, putting those two together, what we get with or out of this is what I call reverse Thrasymachianism. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that's a syllables. Okay. Now the illusion here, right, is philosophers playing games. It's, the connection is to the sophist Thrasymachus in Plato's Republic. All right. And some postmodernists, actually many of them, see a big part of their project as rehabilitating the sophists who've been out of favor for a couple of thousand years. And this makes perfectly good sense. 
Now suppose after doing some philosophy you come to believe truly in subjectivism and relativism, as the sophists do. Accordingly, you come to believe that reason is derivative, will and desire rule, society is a battle of competing wills, words are just tools in the power struggle for dominance, all's fair in love and war. That's of course what the sophists argued 2400 years ago. Now the only difference then between the sophists and the postmodernists is whose side the postmodernists are on. Right. Thrasymachus in book one of the Republic is kind of a representative of a fairly crude second generation sophists. And what we find in him is subjectivist and relativistic arguments marshaled in support of the claim that justice is simply the interests of the stronger. The postmodernists coming after 2,000 years of Christianity, 200 years of socialism simply reverse that. Subjectivism and relativism are true, except they're on the side of the weaker and historically oppressed. Just as contrary to Thrasymachus then is the interest of the weaker. Now, I like this hypothesis because I made it up. <laughs> but I think it still leaves something out. <clears throat> And I think what it leaves out is some psychological components of postmodernism. Okay. The first part of the problem is that I find it hard to believe that the leap of faith goes down very far for most, modernist, most postmodernists. The average postmodernist is a very clever person, has a PhD in the humanities somewhere. So I find it tough to believe that or to make psychologically real for myself the kind of turning off of one's mind that would be necessary to make and sustain that leap of faith. Maybe I need to have an expanded understanding of psychology, but I think there's something else going on here. Let me give you some examples. Some fairly clear contradictions in the postmodernist assertions okay, that any person who is smart and clever has to be aware of. Okay. On the one hand, all truth is relative. Okay. On the other, postmodernism tells it like it really is. Okay. On the one hand, all cultures are equally deserving of respect. On the other, Western culture is uniquely destructive and bad. Values are subjective, okay. but sexism and racism are really evil. Okay. Technology is bad and destructive. It's unfair that some people have more technology than others. Okay? <laughs> Tolerance is good and dominance is bad, but when we, speaking as postmodernists, are in power, we're as politically correct as hell. Okay? Now, there's a common pattern here. What you have is subjectivism and relativism in one breath, dogmatic absolutism in the next. Okay? Now, postmodernists are not stupid. So we can't just say they don't know that this contradiction exists. They're aware of the contradictions, right? and we're pointing them out to them all the time, right? all of the critics. Now, of course, you can say, kind of dismissingly, well, that's just a logical contradiction. Right? And you've got a lot of stuff I took off that will comfort you in that. But I think it's one thing to say that, okay? and it's another thing to sustain it psychologically inside. So it makes me wonder. Which side, then, of the contradiction is really deepest for a postmodernism? Is it the subjectivism and relativism, or is it the dogmatic absolutism? Is it they really believe in the relativism and occasionally lapse into absolutism, or is the absolutism deepest and the relativism is some sort of a tactical cover or other? Now, here's three examples. This time, it's blatant clashes between uh, theory, postmodernist theory, and historical fact. Okay. Postmodernists will say that the West is deeply racist, but they know very well that the West ended slavery for the first time, and that it's only in places where Western ideals are making inroads that uh, racism is on the defensive. They will say that the West is deeply sexist, but they know very well that Western women were the first to get the vote, contractual rights, and that they have opportunities that most of the women in the world are still without. They will say that the Western capitalist countries are cruel to their poorer members, subjugating them, getting rich off them, but they know very well that the poor in the West are far, far richer than poor people in other countries, both in terms of material assets and in terms of opportunities to improve themselves. So there's something else going on here, definitely. Okay. I'm going to argue 
that most postmodernists don't really believe much of what they say, that the word games, the accusations, and that much of the use of anger and rage that is characteristic of their style is not a matter of using words to state things that they think are true, but rather of using words as weapons against an enemy that you still hope to destroy. Think of uh, the use postmodernists will sometimes use of science, for example. You find fairly regularly Einstein's relativity theory. That shows everything's relative. Right? <laughs> Quantum mechanics shows that we can't know anything. Right? Chaos math mathematics shows that the world is irrational. Right? Girdle's incompleteness theorem, right? we've heard of all of these things. Now, these are all cited as proving the postmodernist epistemology, but it's fairly clear especially when you speak to people who enunciate these claims. Here you've got a graduate student in English literature, okay? uh, or some equivalent. Right? They don't know the science, okay? but they are citing the science. Now there's a fun incident. Uh, Alan Sobel, a physicist and social text, which is a postmodernist um, journal, and he wrote an article showing that all of the recent discoveries in physics prove inexorably that Postmodernism is true. Submitted it, was accepted, published, and it was all nonsense. Right? He just wrote it to show that the postmodernists don't know anything about science and that they will just prove anything. Now the reaction, or they will just say anything, okay? right? if, if, if it seems. So, so the reaction of the editors clearly shows this. Okay? They were not arguing, oh no, no, we think that this interpretation of science is true. Right? They knew they had been caught out in a con game. So it can't be that they are publishing these words because they think they're true. They are using the words as a rhetorical weapon. Okay. Truth is not the issue here. 